Well, church, please turn with me in God's word this morning to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. And as uh, we come to this portion of Luke's Gospel, I want you to remember what has been said up to this point. There, There has been a crowd of tens of thousands of people who have come out to see Jesus. He's been healing the sick. He has even raised the dead. He's given the blind sight and he's caused the paralyzed to stand up and walk and even be able to run and leap. He's caused the mute to speak and the deaf to hear. He's done incredible miracles. And so there are tens of thousands of people who are coming out to hear him preach. And I don't know what it was like to hear a sermon from the Lord Jesus but he's the greatest preacher who has ever lived. And what we do know is that the crowds were mesmerized at the wisdom. He was one who taught with authority. Imagine the author of Scripture preaching his own word. It was absolutely incredible. And in Luke 12, verse 32... This follows up a section which we know well. We were here two Sundays ago. It is is a passage that talks about not being anxious. Do not worry. The, the, The flowers of the field, they don't toil or spin and God clothes them. The birds of the air, they don't they don't store up in barns, and yet God feeds them. And will he not clothe you, O you of little faith? And will he not feed you? O you of little faith, if he takes care of flowers and birds, he will certainly take care of you. And he ended that section in verses 30 and 31 of Luke 12 by saying, look, the world seeks after the things of the world. And God knows that you need food and and you need clothing and, and, and a place to live. God knows you need that, okay? And you do. And we're not saying you shouldn't have any concern for those things. But that is not supposed to be the focus of your life. Stuff will never satisfy you. It will never complete you. It will never fulfill you. So he said in verse 31, instead you need to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these other things that you need will be added to you. Now, in verse 32, this is a section which is not in Matthew 6, but it's here in Luke's Gospel. Jesus, after preaching on not worrying, he asks a question here, where is your treasure? And there are some additional things on this section that are not found in Matthew 6, and this is one of the reasons why it is so helpful to read the four Gospels together, because some Gospels include details that others do not. And these three verses, Luke 12, 32 to 34, that we'll look at this morning, these three verses say so much. And much of what is said here is only found in Luke. Jesus said, Luke 12, 32, Fear not little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old and with treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart, there will your heart be also. Jesus again gives the command, fear not, do not be afraid. And and he calls his disciples, whom he's speaking directly to here, little flock. This is a term that God used throughout the Old Testament to speak of His people Israel, the flock of God, and He was their shepherd. 
Here Jesus is speaking to those who believe in Him as His little flock. And the point of calling us a flock is that we have a shepherd. And He provides for us. Again, we do not provide for ourselves. Yeah, we have jobs and we work them and we get paid to do that. But ultimately speaking, it is the good shepherd. It is your Father in heaven. It is the Holy Spirit who leads and guides you. It is God who feeds you. It is God who protects you. It is God who watches over you. You are not in control of your own life, and that's a good thing. He says, little flock. And you say, wait a minute, there's billions of Christians. And he calls us a little flock? Well, (laughs) compared to this shepherd, (laughs) all of our needs and concerns are not too much for him to care for. And though at this time when he said little flock, it was a small number of people, it has grown into billions throughout world history. And this good shepherd, the Lord Jesus, can say, you're a little flock. You know, as your pastor, I do have to say, I have been stretched and challenged. This church is doubled in two years. And I praise God for that because so many of you are new believers. As I've said, I've baptized more people in the last two years of ministry than I did in the previous 16 years. And I praise God for that. I would not call you a little flock because this shepherd, he's operating at 100%. And I'm thankful for it. It's the greatest kind of busy I've ever been. But Jesus, the good shepherd, can can look at a crowds of tens of thousands of people and he says, little flock. And I look at 200 and something people every Sunday and I go, my goodness, Lord, how am I going to... I can't shake all their hands and hug all their necks. I want to. As a pastor, I... I see Jesus referring to a crowd of tens of thousands as a little flock. And I think that's incredible. But that's how great of a shepherd he is. And Jesus, the good shepherd, God the Son, says of our Father in heaven, He says, little flock, don't worry. For it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now on Wednesday night, I preached on the doctrine of adoption from the Scriptures. And by the way, if you're not here on Wednesday nights, you're missing the best time of worship during the whole week. It's my favorite time because this one we dig in the deepest. And I would just encourage you, if you can, be here on Wednesday nights at 6.30 because I promise you it's good stuff. We're studying through the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith. It is the oldest, uh, one of the oldest and, and, and uh, the most widely used confessions of faith by Baptists throughout our 400 or so year history. And, and we were in chapter 12 on adoption this past Wednesday. And, and we, looked, we looked in John chapter 1 and Galatians 4 about how we have been adopted into God's family. And now we can call God Abba or Father And it's an amazing thing that that the one who created the heavens and the earth has made me his son and you his daughter. Here's what you need to understand. When the Bible says in Galatians 4 that we can cry, Abba, Father, what it's saying is you can talk to God like you could speak to a, a loving and gracious Father And not everyone has had the best father. I realize that. But he is a good father. He is the best father. And you can speak to him as you would to a loving and gracious 
and merciful and caring father say, Father, I need your help. I, I don't know what to do. Please help me. And just as a loving father would say to his own son or daughter, I love you. Of course I'll do that for you. Of course I'll help you. Of course I'm there for you. I'm going to walk with you each step of the way. That is what your Father in heaven has promised to do for you. It is your Father's good pleasure. He wants to do this for you. You realize He loves you. Few things make me happier than when my children want to spend time with me and want to talk to me. Because one day they become teenagers and then they're just like, I don't want anything to do with you anymore, right? And so you, you got to enjoy that while you have it. And then at some point later in life, we, we snap out of it and we're like, you know, my parents actually aren't so bad, right? Some of us, it, it takes you way too long to figure that out. But anyways, we, we have a Father in heaven who loves us and He wants to hear from us. Do, do you realize that when you pray, God is eagerly listening to your prayers? you realize that? you have an audience with the King of heaven and earth every time you pray? Do you realize that? If, if, if a president or a governor or a king were to say, would you call me every day and just talk to me and tell me how you're doing and if I can help? Now let's say it's, it's, a, it's a president or a governor or whomever that you like, okay? Not one you dislike, but one that you really like. Okay? It's not a political statement. I'm just saying, this is, this is one you really like. And he says, would you call me every morning at 6 a.m. and just... Well, it would be an incredible privilege, would it not? The king of heaven and earth has asked you to speak to him every day. Some of us don't even bother to talk to him. But we only have a moment or two for him. And it says here, it is your Father's good pleasure. He wants to give you the kingdom. Now here's the thing about the kingdom, brothers and sisters. It's so much bigger than we realize. His kingdom. This includes His gospel and all that it brings. And the way that Jesus speaks of the kingdom, it's already breaking forth into this world right now and it's growing and expanding and it's going to culminate one day when the King of heaven and earth, the Lord Jesus Himself, descends in the clouds of heaven and He comes again to His own children. And the Bible says that we'll rule and we'll reign with Him forever in a real place called heaven. And all of that, now and through eternity, is called the kingdom of God. And it's His good pleasure to give us that kingdom. The amazing thing is, is that we have a Father in heaven who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And He has written us into His holy and sovereign will. That all that He has will be ours forever. And we'll rule and reign with Him forever. You know, a lot of people think, man, if I had some rich uncle somewhere that I didn't know anything about and he passed away and suddenly somebody tells me, hey, you have this rich uncle, he left you $10 million. You'd be blown away, right? Wow! You have an inheritance so much larger than that. So much more valuable. So much greater And you know, we don't think of it that way, but we do. Because here's the thing about money. It can only buy certain things. And the most valuable things, money cannot buy. It has value. I'm not saying it's bad, but the most precious things, money cannot buy. No matter how much you may have. The most valuable things that you have. 
You cannot put a financial value. You cannot put a number. You cannot put a price on them. Because there's not enough money in the world that is ever going to add up to how much my wife and my children mean to me. There's never going to be a number big enough. And here's the thing. Our inheritance with the Father in heaven is even greater than that. I mean, we can't even imagine it. We, we can't even grasp it. We can't even understand it. And Jesus says, little flock, your Father is pleased to give you His kingdom. So what are you worried about all the time? Man, if we understood this, we... I want you to hear me. Because I've been asked by many of you since I preached this two weeks ago, is worry a sin? Yes, it is. Jesus commands us not to do it. And so when we do it, are we sinning? Yes. And here's the thing. Your pastor struggles with that too. This is a sin that is common to all of us, but I'm not going to excuse it. It is a sin, but we have a Savior who is greater than our sin. And we have a Savior who is able to change our hearts and help us to overcome our fears by trusting in Him. I want you to understand something. Yes, worry is a sin, and it's common to every one of us, but the good news is we have a Father in heaven who owns it all and is pleased to give us everything we need and more and give us His eternal heavenly riches that are greater than any amount of money forever. Forever in heaven. And we, if we just realize what we have in Christ, we, if we really understood what the Father has given to us, we would never complain and we would never worry ever again. And the reason that we still complain and worry is because we don't fully get it. We only partially get it. We, we, we've only gotten a glimpse of glory. But man, one day... We're going to get there and we're going to look back and we're going to say, it was so silly of me to worry. It was so silly of me to, to think that way. Jesus says, do you realize it is your Father's good pleasure to give you His kingdom? Not only will He help you, but He wants to. And hear me, I'm not primarily talking about money in this verse. I'm just talking about everything you need and all the joy you can have in Him. He wants to give you these things. Namely, His kingdom, the gospel, eternal life, joy, hope, salvation from sin. A family in heaven that you will never have to say goodbye to. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you His kingdom. He's written you into His will. And He says, you, my child, you get everything. I, I, just, I don't think we understand verse 32, but I'll keep going. Because I don't fully get it either. Because if I did, I'd never worry or complain ever again. Verse 33. Now Jesus talks about money. He talks about stuff down here. And this is what he says. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old and with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Wait a minute. What did Jesus just tell me to do in verse 33? Sell your possessions? Uh-oh. What's he talking about? Don't put your cars on Craigslist just yet. Don't, don't stick a sign in, front of, in your front yard just yet. Maybe that's what God wants you to do, but I'm not saying that you all need to go home and sell everything that you have. That's not the point here. Again, let's read verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide 
yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Or as Jesus said in Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So, so, so here's what Jesus is saying. Don't live for stuff. And if you're too tied down to it, maybe you do need to get rid of some of it. Here's the incredible thing about possessions. There's always more. Here's the thing about money. You can always spend it. it just, just imagine, okay, let's say tomorrow you get a phone call and it's from a court somewhere and they say, your rich uncle that you've never heard of passed away and he left you $10 million. Imagine that. And so you get a check for $10 million. What would you do with it? Serious question. What would you do with it? I'll tell you what I'd do with it. I'd invest it. And I would take that investment and all that it produces and I'd give the majority of it away. And I'd be a blessing to my church and my community and people that I love. And yeah, I'd spend some of it. I'd enjoy some of it. I'd make sure my children are taken care of. My wife. I'd pay off my house. I'd do all those things. But I don't need that. Not that much. And if God entrusted that to me, I'd give the majority of it away. I would. I think it'd be wrong for me to spend that much on myself. But I can tell you what most people will do because there's something that we call the lottery. Ever heard of it? And man, if you just read the stories of people who've won the lottery, they can lose a whole lot more than $10 million. Amen? It's amazing. Most of them end up dead. And if not destitute in a matter of just a few short years. Because your problems are not money. They're not. Your, your, your main problem is not money. You know what your main problem is? Your heart. Your heart. Your sin. Your need of a Savior. And I've got good news for you. Your main problem is solved if you'll trust in Jesus Christ. And then He'll take care of the finances, okay? But your main problem is you. I'm not picking on you, but that's the truth. Your main problem is you're a sinner who needs a Savior. The good news is Jesus is your Savior. So he says, sell your possessions. You don't need too much. You don't need to hang on to it forever, okay? Be willing to give things away. He's not saying sell it all right now, but what he is saying is don't be so attached to it and be willing to give. And be generous. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Now look, 2 Thessalonians 3.10 is also in the Bible. It says, if a man will not work, then he will not eat. Let him not eat. That's a command to the Thessalonians where they had people in the local church who thought Jesus was going to come back like next week. So they literally quit their jobs and they depended on other people to feed them and take care of them. We're talking about grown men who didn't want to work and expected other people to take care of them until Jesus came back. And Paul says, stop feeding them, let them starve. And maybe when they get hungry enough, they'll go back to work. Okay, so that's in the Bible too. So when it says give to the needy, it's not saying give frivolously. And listen, sometimes there are people that the worst thing you can do for them is give them cash because they'll likely go buy drugs. I'm not saying you shouldn't help them, but there is a right way to help them. And that's a matter of wisdom and prudence and understanding the situation. So when you're exiting off the interstate and somebody's standing there with a sign, I'm not saying don't help them at all, but I am saying that giving them cash might not be the best way to do it. Okay? 
But the point in this text is you need to be willing to give to others who are in need. Because I'll tell you something, if there's someone in my church family that I know who's in need, we're going to take care of it, church. We had a pastor that none of you I don't think have ever met. Has anyone in here ever met Brother Carl Griffith in your life? Raise your hand. Not one of you. I'm the only one my wife. That's it. We raised $4,000 for the man on the spur of a moment. Why? Because he has a wife and children. He passed away suddenly. That's not even in our church. Listen, we are to love one another and care for one another. And if you are in this church family and you are in need, we will help you. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to give you an endless amount of money, but we are really seriously going to try to help you. Understand that. We're in this thing together. We are a family. This is a church. It's not a social club. This is, this is not the Rotary Club. I'm not against those things. I'm just saying, this is bigger than that. This is deeper than that. This is a bigger commitment than that. This is a tighter family than that, okay? Understand something. There is something spiritual here. God has brought us together as a church. You don't need to worry. So give to the needy. Be willing to let go of it. And here's the thing. When you let go of some of your money, you know what you're doing? You're saying, God, I trust you to feed me tomorrow. One of the reasons why people are often unwilling to give is because they don't trust God to take care of tomorrow. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. So he says, be willing to sell your possessions, give to the needy, and then he says, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. Some Bibles say purses. And all the ladies said, oh, come on. Amen. Right? What is he saying? Well, it's the same thing in Matthew 6. Store for yourselves treasure in heaven. Right? Invest in eternal things. Invest in the things that money cannot buy because those are the most valuable things. Now, sometimes you can take money and use it to invest in the more valuable things. Like, you can put a missionary on a mission field. You can support your local church, right? You, you can do things to bring the gospel and hope to people. And that's far greater than any amount of money it takes to put that missionary in that far-off tribe in Africa or Asia. Because he's, he's bringing them the riches of heaven when he goes and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ to him. To those people. So he says, provide for yourselves money bags that do not grow old and with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. What is this word? This word fail or cease. It's something that never goes away. You do realize that your dollars will one day be worthless. You say, well, you don't have faith in the American economy. Well, actually, not that much, but that's not my point. When Jesus comes back, all that money, it's not going to be worth anything. Now, am I saying, well, just throw it all away right now? No, I'm, I'm saying use it wisely and invest in eternal things. Understanding that one day your dollars are going to be worthless. I mean, listen, in heaven, they paved the streets with gold. Do you understand? They paved the streets with gold. <laughs> You're not going to need money. You're not going to need it. Provide yourselves with treasure in heaven. That does not fail. It never ends. It never ceases because one day your money will cease. Where no thief approaches, no one can steal what Christ purchased for you when he shed his blood for you on the cross. No one can take that from you. People can steal your car or your money out of your bank account. But no one can steal eternal life from you. So store up treasure there. 
where it can never fade and never be taken. And where there are no moths to destroy it. Live for eternity. Yeah, you need a car and you need a house and you need some stuff. But that should not be the focus of your life. And in verse 34, here's, here's the main point. Here's what Jesus is driving at. Church, hear me. These words are so true. And we all need to really hear them and think about them. Look at Luke 12, verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So here's my question. Where is your treasure? Is it on earth or is it in heaven? Because that tells me everything about you. What do you think about the most? What are you concerned about the most? What occupies your mind and your heart the most? And if it's not eternity, you've gotten it wrong. And let's be honest with ourselves. Most of the time, we're not thinking about eternity. And we're not thinking about what really matters. And that's wrong. That's why we need to hear these words. Where your treasure is, there's where your heart is. There's a funny thing about your checkbook or your wallet. It's like it has a string attached to it. And the moment you pull your wallet out, your heart's being pulled by that string. Whatever you spend your money on reveals what you care about. Whatever your financial priorities are, those are your heart's priorities. What do I spend most of my money on? I'll be honest with you, my wife and my kids, and they're worth it. I give to my church and missions and all those kinds of things. And do I enjoy some of it and spend it on things just for fun? Of course. But that is a comparatively very small portion to what it takes to feed these four kids, let me tell you. Amen, somebody? All right, thank you. I'm not the only one. But here's the thing. They're worth it, okay? I'm not complaining. They're worth it, I think. Anyways, the point is... <laughs> I love you guys. All right, so <laughs> where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart's attached to your wallet. I'm talking about money because Jesus talked about money. And if you're new here, I just want you to know, I started, oh gosh, two Christmases ago in Luke chapter 1 verse 1, and now we're in Luke chapter 12 verse 34. You know where I'm going to be next Sunday, verse 35. And it's about Jesus returning and it fits in with Easter perfectly. And yes, I planned that. But here's the thing. I'm talking about money because I'm going through Luke's gospel and Jesus talks about money because we need to hear it. Church. If you come here and worship here, if you are willing to trust this church with you and your husband or wife and your children's souls, and you're not willing to trust this church to utilize some of your dollars for the glory of God and His kingdom, something's wrong. Do you realize trusting your souls to this local church is far bigger of a deal than giving some money? Jesus says, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The answer is nothing. Why? Because you have nothing more valuable. And I take that stewardship very seriously. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 verse 17, that one day I will have to give an account as your pastor to the Lord Jesus. And I think about that often. 
what we do with the money that is given here is we use it for God's kingdom. Right off the top, 19% of every dollar that's given in the offering plate goes to missions in this community and around the world. And then the other 81%, we still give more of that away. And then there's money spent on taking care of the buildings and yes, paying my salary because my wife and kids like to eat. I already told you that. It supports missions. It brings the gospel to people. Part of your worship is giving. And if you're unwilling to do that, why? Is this church not trustworthy? I mean, if you're coming here, you must think to some extent we are. We, we have a meeting every month. You see how every dollar is spent. Every dollar. Every member of this church knows how every dollar is spent. At least you can know. I mean, we print it out and hand it to you once a month in the business meeting. There's no secrets here. Or maybe it's not that you don't trust the church. Maybe it's that you just don't trust God to take care of you if I give this money away today, maybe I won't have enough for tomorrow. Now listen, I'm not saying give it all away. I'm saying give a small portion of it away. Under the Old Testament, the standard was 10%. Under the New Covenant, we're actually not given a law, a tithe law, but certainly that's a guide for how we ought to give. So I personally have decided to give at least 10% away, and I give more than that, but that's because I'm able to. Maybe you're not able to do that. I don't know what God would have you give, but He would have you give something. And the thing is, where your treasure is, there is your heart. Let me take you to the right in the book. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I just want to, as we close, I want to address this concern. Maybe the reason that you're unwilling to give is because you don't trust that God's going to take care of you and your family tomorrow. I have good news for you. He's promised to take care of you and your family. I did not say He promised to make you rich. I did not say He promised to give you a Ferrari. But I did say He promises to feed you and clothe you and give you shelter. And even more than that. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to begin in verse 6, and I'm going to make a few comments as I go because these verses are often twisted and distorted. I've preached a whole sermon on this before. It's on YouTube. I preached it on a Wednesday night several months ago. But I want you to hear this. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And see, there were churches in the region of Macedonia who had given far much, far above what the Corinthians gave. And here's the thing. The Corinthians were a relatively wealthy church. There were a lot of rich people in this church that Paul's writing to. And there was other churches in, 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 to the northeast of them in Macedonia. And, and they gave far more, and yet they were poor people for the most part. And so Paul's saying, gosh, these poor people are out giving the, the rich church over here in Corinth. What's, what's the deal, guys? Why are you being so stingy? So he says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That is not saying that if you put $10 in the offering plate, God will give you back 100 And anybody who ever has preached that, they'll answer to Jesus one day. You'll see in a moment, the harvest he's talking about is a spiritual harvest. He's saying you give to missions for the purpose of spreading the gospel. You don't put money in the offering plate to try to get money back. This is not a spiritual ATM machine or slot machine, okay? This is not what this is. You give it because you want the gospel to go forward. That's why you give it. So whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Notice it does not tell us to give an exact percentage. But it does say we must give. And then we must give as we've decided in our heart. I think under the new covenant, the standard ought to, for most people, be at least as high as it was under the old covenant, and that was 10%. So that's a guide, but it's not a law and it's not a rule. Each must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. 
If you don't want to give, don't. Because God's not glorified by reluctant giving. Don't do it reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Give because you want to. Verse 8. Here's the promise. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. There's the promise. I promise you God will take care of tomorrow. I promise you He won't let you starve. That's what Paul says. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things... What does that mean? He'll take care of you. He didn't say He'd make you rich. He did say He would take care of you and your family. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, He is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Verse 10, so he who supplies seed to the sower. Now, now earlier he said when you give financially, you're sowing seed. He provided you with the money to give. And so he says, the one who provided you with the seed to sow is also the one who provides you with bread for food. You know he feeds you too, right? That's why you pray before you eat, or you should. You used to say, thank God, thank you God for not letting me starve today. Because you could have starved, but he fed you. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Notice the harvest is not financial. It is spiritual. It is a harvest of righteousness. You give so that the gospel will go forward. Don't give for any other reason. Anyone who preaches that health, wealth, and prosperity garbage that you hear on TBN is not preaching the true gospel and what the Bible actually says. Don't give unless you're giving for the purpose of the kingdom spreading and the gospel going out. That's the only reason you should be willing to give. Verse 11. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. You know, one of the reasons God gives you more than you need is because He's given you some extra because He wants you to give it back. You realize that? He's provided you with extra so that you get the joy of giving. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints. Christians, they took care of one another. That's what that means. You're not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God because the gospel goes forward and you got to help be a part of that and make it happen. Every dollar you put in the offering plate, there are missionaries on the field that will receive that within the next month. You realize? You realize that? Every month, this church is sending checks to missionaries in Africa, Asia, Central America. Now, do you realize that? Those missionaries are on the field right now, and we get to help feed them next week. And the people where they're preaching the gospel, get to hear the gospel. And get, get this, get this. One day we're going to meet those people in heaven. That's why you give. You give because He gave you so much. He gave His only Son, God in human flesh. He lived a perfect sinless life. You and I, we have not. He died upon the cross to pay for our sins because He had none of His own. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the grave, appeared to over 500 people, ascended to the right hand of the Father in heaven, and one day soon, he's coming again. And when he does, believe me, you will not be saying, I wish I had spent more on myself. You're not going to say that. All you're going to be wanting to do is worship him and praise him and, and, and rule and reign with him in a real place called heaven forever. That's all you're going to care about. And you're going to look back on your worries and the, the, the things that you wasted your, your mental energy on. The things you stressed about and you're going to go, oh my gosh, that was so foolish. Why, why, was I, why was I worried about the electric bill when my God owns the cattle on a thousand hills? If 
God would have just understood exactly. So here's the point. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven. With your time, with your work, with your money, with your husband, your wife, your children, your grandchildren. Invest in what really matters most. Your reward is great in heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word in each one here. Lord, help us to receive your word and humbly obey. Give us grace, Lord. Give us wisdom. Help us to understand that you really have promised to provide us all sufficiency in all things at all times. Forgive us for doubting you and worrying. Give us the grace. Give us the faith to trust and obey you. And may you be glorified, Lord, when we do it. We thank you for Christ our Savior. Help us to live lives that glorify Him. Help us, Lord, to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. These things we ask in the name of our eternal King, the Lord Jesus. Amen.